hello um, and welcome to the session called Accelerating Prototype to Commercial Device with Snapdragon and Ubuntu Core. My name is Aksana Wilcox. I am the manager of product planning for Qualcomm Technologies, working on Qualcomm Snapdragon embedded processors. This presentation actually has three presenters. There's two colleagues of mine here from Canonical. I will uh, transition to them after my section. They will talk more about the Ubuntu Core. Um, we all know IoT industries, embedded computing industries, mass market, whatever the terms that you're most familiar with, are all looking to create smart connected devices. And where do we best look for technologies that are already proven, have unparalleled scale, have um, integrated capabilities, rapid development cycles, other than mobile? So the smartphone technology is truly from digital signal processing, from the fast CPUs, from um, graphic processing units, integrated GPS, integrated connectivity from Wi-Fi to Bluetooth, um, optimized multimedia, multimedia performances, power management, small, power, small memory size, and of course, um, support for various operating system other than the in mobile space. Uh, Qualcomm Technologies, obviously, as most of you know, is a semiconductor company that's been um, providing Snapdragon solutions to mobile OEMs and tablets for many, many years. So understanding the demands of the embedded computing industry, we wanted to capitalize on the investments that we've made in the mobile space and bring it to the computing and um, Internet of Things um, industries. Just a quick snapshot on what type of challenges we imagine there are in differences between mobile OEMs and embedded customers. And I won't go through every single thing on the list, but understanding that, understanding that helps us select particular processors and understand what type of enablement that we need and would be required to um, bring this to the market. From the mobile OEMs and embedded customers' perspective, the relationships are very different, from high-touch, one-on-one, dedicated FAEs and support, to very low-touch and potentially web-only support, from fulfilling directly to distribution, from requirement for minimum orders of millions of devices to tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands, and dealing with sheer number of uh, customers going from a handful of OEMs and ODMs to hundreds of thousands of customers that all in aggregate add up to a tremendous business opportunity for the company. So understanding all of that and all of those challenges um, allowed us to focus on selecting a particular Snapdragon embedded portfolio um, that we are now offering in mar mass market space that spans from low end to mid range to high end devices, Snapdragon devices. Um, from a lower end, we introduced Snapdragon 410, which is an ARM um, A53, 63, uh, sorry, 32 and 63 bit capable device, 1.2 gigahertz per core, um, as well as Snapdragon 600, which is mid tier from our perspective, 1.5 gigahertz per core with Qualcomm proprietary CPU called Crate. Uh, we introduced those devices most recently with what we call an ESQ, which stands for um, extended life. Um, that in our, um, in our terminology means that these devices will be available through the year of 2025, which we believe, believe is, a, is, is a key requirement for the embedded space. We're currently in the process of identifying a SKU for the premium tier, which at Qualcomm it's uh, called 800 series. Um, currently, there are modules available based on Snapdragon 820, which is one of the premium tier devices. However, we're still working on the dedicated SKU that we'll put through the channel and make available to mass market. So please stay, stay tuned. Um, look on our site and they'll become available relatively soon. Um, again, kind of a, an eye chart slide. You don't need to see this side by side and don't need me to speak to side by side in detail, but also tells you again about the breadth, breadth of portfolio that we're offering. Um, if if uh, the types of devices that your end customers or you as an end customer are looking to launch don't require a lot of capacity, they don't, don't require as, as high of a speed and potential um, performance of GPU, then you could select a device like a 410, which has obvious benefits uh, that, that uh, include the cost factor as well. I won't speak to the cost specifically, but um, that's one of the reasons we have a series of low tier to mid tier devices. Um, the Snapdragon 410, interesting, interesting factoid, supports three different operating systems, supports Android, 
several distributions in Linux and Windows 10 IoT. Um, we are currently working on adding that to 600, but it does support Linux and Android right now. Selecting processors and making them available in mass market through our partner, I've omitted to mention that on one of the first slides, our partner Air Electronics, which a lot of you probably have bought devices or electronics or parts from them. Selecting the, the devices and making them, putting them through the channel was just the first challenge for us. Understanding what else is required, uh, that the ecosystem that's required to actually enable your customer not only take that device or take that board and prototype on it and actually launch it in the commercial product that customers would buy is a completely different story. And the things that we understood and addressed were the need for community boards. We have, um, for each processor in the channel, we had developed a board called Dragon Board. It's a Qualcomm trademark. We have a Dragon Board 410C right now available. It's been launched for over a year. It's been a very successful development platform for software for us. We're working on developing and launching Dragon Board 600C, and then in the near future, 820C. So please tune, stay tuned again. The best way to learn about what's coming is going to um, developer.qualcom.com. It's our community site that um, if you sign up as a developer, then you'll get email um, information about the new products coming. So that solves for the hardware situation. Then what do you do with the software? With the software, we work very closely with Linaro, 96boards.org, where Qualcomm is a member. Um, as part of our membership, we have a dedicated team of engineers that helps develop in our platforms. So they're the, all three platforms that I just mentioned are currently being worked on to add additional features in Linux um, Open Embedded and Linux uh, Debian, as well as we have a, a group of folks who work with at Canonical that enable additional features through Ubuntu Core. Um, I've mentioned longevity. Again, all these chipsets come with a 10-year commitment from Qualcomm. Um, We're continuing to work on making more and more publicly available documentation and tools, um, as well as um, I wanted to introduce the concept of what we call a Snapdragon Technology Partner. Um, that is um, a group of companies that have early access to Qualcomm processors, a lot of expertise in working with Qualcomm source code, Qualcomm documentation and tools. They develop modules, um, whether it's SOMs or SBCs or full-on development kits based on Qualcomm processors. A lot of the time, way ahead of those processors becoming available in the marketplace. So customers could go to them, get access to those devices, prototype, by the time they make a decision that that is the right processor for them to actually do a chip down design or a custom module, they could come to Qualcomm, or actually they could come to Air Electronics and buy the actual chip down discrete part um, at that point from, um, from Air Electronics. So it just kind of gives you yet another, another view and a few names of customers like, um, or partners like, again, Air Electronics, Ian for Chips, Enforced Computing, Intrinsic, Verisite, Canonical, even though you guys are most, you know, you're all on the software side, but nonetheless, you provide software integration services. So having taken care of the hardware, the documentation, the tools, the hardware partners, um, obviously software is key. Um, we look at that from enabling the various high-level operating system support, middleware, and integrating with cloud providers. Currently, Snapdragon processors and, of course, the boards that have the processors in them as I mentioned, support the three key operating systems, Android. For Linux, we support Debian, Open Embedded, and Ubuntu Core distributions, and then Windows 10 IoT Core. We have integrated with all join, IBM Watson, IoT platform, and we have robotics OS running on 4.10 and 600. For cloud partners, we partner with AT&T, AWS IoT. You could actually, if you go on Amazon, you could buy Dragon Board 4.10C, AWS kit that um, is integrated with their APIs and runs Linux Debian. Uh, we have a recipe for IBM Bluemix. It's available either on Bluemix or on, on Aero.com, and we are partners with Microsoft Azure. So hopefully rounding up a software ecosystem solution to get the developers what they need and have, um, have flexible options for them. Really quickly, I'll touch on the community board, and then I'll pass on to my colleagues, Kyle and, and Lowry here from Canonical, to talk about the work that we're, they're doing with Snapdragon and Dragon Board. Um, Dragon 410, 410C is a commercial product. It's a product by Aero, designed and um, initially designed by Qualcomm. Um, truly a prototype platform for software development. 
and also for prototype of actual kind of commercial devices. If any of your customers or yourselves wanted to buy it, you go to Arrow, you buy the product, you get a particular FAE assigned to your organization to work with you to see if this is the right product for you, potentially modules, potentially actual um, chip down design for your, for your product. But this is a great way to get experience with Snapdragon processors. Um, we are very committed to um, open source um, distributions and upstreaming. As the, for that reason, we're very involved with Lenaro Foundation as well as 96 boards. So all the Dragon boards that we make to give access to Qualcomm processors, early stage Qualcomm, early stage access to existing Qualcomm processors, they're all 96 boards compliant, which means they're compliant to the 96 board CE open hardware specification. And the great thing about that, that any um, mezzanine board, any accessory that's built to that specification by other vendors, be it Seed or Linker or Groove or anyone, um, they will work with our boards, as well as they will work with any other board that 96 boards is selling, just to not to undersell them. And um, that pretty much wraps up my portion, unless I think we'll probably take questions if we need to at the end. But at this point, I'd like to introduce Kyle Fazari and um, uh, Lowry Snow from, actually, yes, from um, Canonical. Hi, thank you guys. Uh, I'm really going to let Kyle spend most of the time talking about how a developer or a, a company designing a device would uh, choose to uh, select components that would accelerate the time to market. But I wanted to highlight something very important. Because of the work that we've been doing with Qualcomm and with Lenaro, Qualcomm and Canonical, along with some of the, the hardware partners that, that Qualcomm's working with, we have a, a unique uh, value proposition for a device manufacturer or for a developer that's, that's selecting which parts to build with to take a device to market. Fortunately for developers in the embedded space today, more than ever before with words like uh, IoT and Internet of Everything, there's a grand focus on, on uh, providing tools and modules that allow a device manufacturer to quickly build something that can go from prototype to market very quickly. So the value prop for building with Snapdragon and Ubuntu Core is unlike what you might see with, with other hardware vendors and software distros. We provide an, an Ubuntu OS image that is a reference image that's supported for a five-year period of time with security and maintenance updates, which is an LTS release. And, and that's because of the, the work that we've done with the Lenaro Group and, and with Qualcomm. Along with that, that OS that can be used to take a device to market without any additional formal agreement with, with Canonical, we have an entire infrastructure and, uh, and, and distribution mechanism that allows you to upload an app and have your app available on your device with over-the-air updates uh, for, for free. We're offering that entire app delivery and update mechanism for any developer and device manufacturer. Uh, and that's the message that, that you get when you take a hardware reference design from Qualcomm and then this reference OS image that goes along with that. Um, most companies opt to do that work on their own. Most developers opt to do that work on their own. Uh, Oksana mentioned the software integration service that we provide. Along with this reference image that can be adapted for your use, we do uh, offer consulting services and engineering services to further enable your device for, for market. Uh, I, I'm going to uh, pass on now to uh, Kyle, who's going to talk very specifically about uh, something that was done to take a device to market and how easy it would be to build off of this concept to very quickly uh, build a prototype and then take that prototype to market. So software engineer Kyle Fazari. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Kyle Fazari and as Larry mentioned, I am very proudly a grunt software engineer. I, I work on this, well specifically I work on the packagers called Snapcraft. I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. But as Larry mentioned, what I want to talk about is how easy it is to go from a prototype you have to an image you can flash in the factory and ship using Ubuntu Core. And to do that, 
I'm going to give you a quick overview of what Ubuntu Core exactly is, uh, and then walk you through an example that, that is something you could actually buy today. Um, so let's get started. So I'm going to cover each of these points. Is, anyway, these aren't the right slides. Hold on, sorry. There we go. OK. So I'll cover each of these in detail. But, but what is Ubuntu Core? Well, it's, as you I probably know, Ubuntu is based on Debian. Uh, Ubuntu Core is a distribution of Ubuntu that uses a different packaging format called Snaps, which gives it a couple of, of interesting properties. First of all, it gives it transactional updates, which means uh, it's updated at atomically. And if you lose power or the update goes bad, right, then you can roll back to a previous version. Uh, snaps have confinement built into them, right? So you can, you, you get confinement. That's a pretty easy story for additional security. Uh, the, the developer experience to actually create snaps is, is really well thought through. Like I said, this is, <laughs> this is what I work on here. This is where I'm focused with a tool called Snapcraft. Uh, and then, as Larry mentioned, there's the store that you get for free where uh, you, you push an update and all your devices automatically get that update. And finally, there's the fact that Ubuntu Core nicely plugs into the trusted cadence that Ubuntu has long established. Um, so let me go through each of these points. So first of all, what are snaps? At its most basic level, a snap is simply a squash FS image with some metadata in it. Now that metadata, the, the spec for it, you know, what makes this squash FSA snap is determined by a governing body from uh, a, a bunch of different distributions here. So we try to keep it as neutral as possible, which means that snaps run on a, different, a number of different distributions, including regular old Ubuntu desktop and server, uh, Debian, Arch, right, among others. Uh, and then because of the store, it allows you to deliver your updates directly instead of having to go through the, the various package management mechanisms that all of those distros use. Uh, now, another property of the fact that, that these are squashed images is that they also bundle all their dependencies, which makes them th this immutable blob that is your software, which gives us a, an interesting architecture here. So I want to compare and contrast classic Ubuntu here on the left, which is deb-based, with Ubuntu Core on the right. Now, debs can include anything and put files anywhere, right? And they run hooks as root. You, they share libraries, right? You can easily get into this dependency hell that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And, and there are security issues with being able to, you know, when you install a deb, it, it owns your system. It can do anything at once, right? Its hooks run as root. With Ubuntu Core, it's restructured a bit into these snaps where the kernel is a kernel snap. The OS part is a core snap. And then you have applications on top of that. It's a little less flexible, but it's really nice for IoT devices. So I've talked about the fact that this the snaps are squash FS images, which by definition means they are read only. Applications are sort of limited if they can't write data, right? So there are some specific areas where the snap is allowed to write uh, with, uh, because of confinement, which I'll talk about in a second. But the point is where the snap is putting data is a known place, which gives us this nice property where you have a snap and you have its associated data that's tied to its revision. So when an update comes along, right, let's say, let's say the data that it's holding is a database. When an update comes along, the first thing it does is run the migration on that, run some migration on that database. Let's say that migration goes bad, right? This database is now corrupted. Thankfully, when, as part of the update process, the original snap and the original data that was associated with that revision is kept. Uh, let's see, uh, three are kept in total, two old ones and a current one. Which means if a failure occurs, then it can just roll back to the previous version and you're back up and running right before the upgrade actually happened. So let's talk about confinement. There are a couple of different confinement technologies at play here. One is AppArmor and the other one is SecComp filters. And some other ones too, but those are really the main ones where snaps are limited to in where they can write and their system related capabilities. And the way that's split out is by something that we call interfaces. So you make your snap and you know, okay, I need to be able to talk to the internet. So in your snap metadata, you specify this snap needs the network interface. And that's some, some syscalls, right, that are whitelisted for you and, and some app armor access, access granted. Uh, 
and what that does, uh, you know, if, you've, if you were in any of the security-related talks earlier, you know that security is not perfect, right? Nothing's going to be perfect. But this isolates the damage an attacker can do if they, if they manage to, to break in, right? The only thing that's going to happen if they break into this one, right, is that they gain that. They don't gain any of that. So let's talk about Snapcraft for a little bit. <clears throat> Since, as I mentioned, snaps bundle their dependencies, you end up having a lot of disparate pieces, right, that make up this snap, each of which have their own build system, build technology, et cetera. Snapcraft is the tool that takes all of those disparate pieces and puts them into one cohesive unit called this snap. Uh, it can reuse dev packages. So, you know, if your component requires boost, you don't actually need to build boost from source. You can just say, hey, pull, pull boost from the archives and, and stage that into the snap. And the way it supports all of these various build technologies is by a plugin system, which new ones are being written all the time. And you can actually, you can actually distribute your own in the source with the Snapcraft. This is all specified by YAML, the Snapcraft YAML, if you, want, if you have sort of an interesting build process that you need to use. Um, tons of plugins are already out there in upstream uh, Snapcraft. These are a couple of the examples. Oh, and Snapcraft.io, if you're interested in learning more about this, how to make a Snap, that's your starting point, Snapcraft.io. Another thing I mentioned was the store. One of the biggest problems with IoT devices that are already out there is that they rely on the user to update, or they have no update mechanism whatsoever. This store, the whole Snap story, this is already included in it. And so if you make an image that is based on Snaps and you ship it, if you push an updated Snap to the store, all these devices are already going to automatically update, just as a side effect of using Ubuntu Core. Now, in addition to that, there are some opportunities for new revenue if you're, if, if you're interested in this, right? So if you've got snaps on your device, there's another snap that you can install called Snap Web. So let's say I buy a router that is snap-based, and it comes maybe with Snap Web pre-installed. I can actually visit it and install new snaps just by using that interface, which means you can sell add-ons that your users can install this way. And finally, the cadence, which, which many of you will be familiar with here, right? You've got Ubuntu 14.04 supported for five years. That's an LTS. You've got the three development releases between it and 16.04, which is an LTS. And then three more releases and 18.04, which will be an LTS. Ubuntu Core fits in on these LTS lines, starting with 16. And it's supported for five years, and then 18 for five years, just like Lowry mentioned. <clears throat> so that's sort of the high-level overview. I actually want to walk you through some lower level details of, of how you might actually go from a prototype to production. And to do that, I'm going to use the next cloud box. Now, this is something you can actually buy today. I've got one with me. Uh, and it's based on Ubuntu Core. And so I'm going to use this as the enabler to talk about, OK, well, this was, as do viewers will note, based on a Raspberry Pi 2. What if I wanted to make a new one based on a Dragon Board? Right? It's, it's really easy. Uh, so let's pretend that your prototype is this next cloud snap, okay? Every Ubuntu core image is made up of at least three snaps. This gadget snap on the bottom, the kernel snap, which sits on top of that, if you will, the core snap, and then whatever application snaps you put on top. And I want to talk through each one of those in a little more detail. So let's start with this gadget snap. So I'm, so I'm remaking this device, but now it's based on a dragon board. The gadget snap is what holds your bootloader. Uh, you, you know, any sort of file system layout that you specify, uh, some default configurations for services that are on there. And like Lowry was mentioning, the Dragon Board is our ARM64 reference board, which means if you're using a Dragon Board, this is already made for you. You don't need to worry about it. It's already provided and maintained. You can make your own if you want to, but you don't have to. The kernel snap, right? This one's pretty obvious. It's a 4.4 based kernel with the device drivers, et cetera, right? And again, since this is a reference device, this is something that's already provided as part of this LTS. So if you're using the Dragon Board, you can use this default kernel, and you don't need to worry about any updates whatsoever. The core snap, this is the execution environment. This is, this is a nice thin OS, if you will, for application snaps. It includes the init system, basic services, uh, you know, basic files and libraries. So like, not all snaps actually bundle libc. They can use the one that's in the core snap. 
and again, if you're using a dragon board, you don't need to worry about making this. It's already provided and maintained. Again, you can make your own if you want. Now this is where, this is where you really come in, right? So Nextcloud is our example here. You use Snapcraft to create this application snap, right? What makes your device unique? Uh, so for, in the example of Nextcloud, I talked about how they bundle their dependencies and they're these disparate build systems, right? So Nextcloud bundles Apache, MySQL, PHP, Redis, right? a number of things that makes a web application, and, and that's its snap. So if you put all these together, you end up with something that is nicely flashable to uh, you know, a board in, in factory production, but how do we get there? And I, I'm actually gonna take you through that. And it goes, I'm actually gonna go down to the CLI here. So uh, don't worry, I won't type. I got them here, but there are a couple of things you need to do this. Uh, so every image, like I mentioned, is made of a kernel, or excuse me, gadget, kernel, and core snap. And then whatever you wanna add on top. So in our case, that's Nextcloud. And then the two extra pieces you need are a store account, I'll talk about that in a second, and Ubuntu image, which is the tool to actually create a flashable image. So the first thing you do is create the store account. And the reason we do this is because Ubuntu Core is gonna verify the image it's booting actually comes from you. In order for that to happen, you have to create a key and register it to your account so that it you know, has something to figure out. So if you go to myapps.developer.ubuntu.com, create your free account, uh, record your account ID. You're gonna need that in a second. Now, these slides, can we put them somewhere so that people can actually refer to it later, I, I assume? Yeah, okay, okay, very good, very good. So the next step is to actually install Ubuntu image and the related tools to, to make the image that, uh, that you're gonna flash. So Snapcraft and Snapd, those are needed to generate, register, and actually use the signing key. And then Ubuntu image, as I mentioned, is the one that actually puts the image together. Now you're gonna create a key. <clears throat> so in order to build the image, like I said, you, you, you need to be able to assert that this is your image with your key, so SnapD has something to verify. So you use Snapcraft create key to actually generate a key. This is just GPG behind the scenes, it's, it's nothing magic. Uh, and then you check that everything goes okay, right? Snapcraft list keys, make sure your key's listed there. And then finally register it with your account. So Snapcraft register key. Uh, by this time, let's see. I, I believe it will actually ask for your login info, Snapcraft register key that is associated with your account, and then it registers it. And then at that point, you can use it to actually sign assertions. And what is an assertion? I'll talk about that in a second. So we're gonna create what defines our model. And, and in, this, in this case, our model is the device that we're gonna ship. So what is the software that makes up this device? Uh, so it, it is, it's JSON, it's JSON file. And it answers some pretty basic questions like what's your model's name? And in my case, I just said Nextcloud Dragon. Which Ubuntu core series are you targeting? So there are only two, right? Well, there's, there's Snappy 15, but it, it's, it, I wouldn't recommend it. It's based on some older stuff. So, so either 16 or 18. 18 isn't really out yet, so I wouldn't recommend that. So we're talking about 16 here. Uh, what architecture is this for? Well, this is the Dragon board, so ARM64. What gadget snap is being used? So the, the one that Canonical provides is called Dragon Board. So I just use that here. If you were using your own, you would just specify a file path. Uh, same with the kernel snap, Dragon Board Linux. That's the one from Canonical. Again, you could specify a, a file path here. Uh, Who is defining this model? So this authority ID, brand ID, these, these two fields is where your store account ID comes in, that thing that you recorded earlier. You paste that in here. And then when was this model defined? Just you get that from the date command and then you can put it in there. And finally, that was all sort of boilerplate stuff. This is the interesting part. What extra snaps are included in this image, right? How does this, how is this different than just the, well, basically if you erase required snaps here and put Canonical's authority and brand ID, you end up with the image that uh, you could download from, from uh, uh, Ubuntu.com for the Dragon Board. The required snaps is really the interesting part where you, where you customize it. Or you can replace the gadget kernel, et cetera. All right, so now this is where we turn the model definition into a model assertion by signing it. Well, you simply cat it out to snap sign. You see you use the, the my key name here and, and redirect it to dragon.model. It'll sign it and then you end up with your, your dragon.model assertion. 
And if you actually look at it, it contains the exact same information as the JSON file plus the signature. And that's, that's the, the file that we really needed to just hand it to Ubuntu image so it can put the thing together. So you simply run uh, sudo Ubuntu image. The hyphen C uh, option gives it the ability to pull the snaps from different channels. I haven't really talked about that. But really quickly, uh, every snap has a number of channels that it can be released in. Uh, the most unstable being edge, and then beta, candidate, and then stable. Uh, so that gives you the ability to roll out your software in stages instead of just immediately releasing to stable all the time. So in this case, I want every, every snap that is part of this image coming from the stable channel. So I give it there hyphen O, the, giving it the, the output image file. And finally, the model assertion that I want it to use to make this image. That's all it needs. After a few minutes, you'll end up with the Dragon Eye image. It's going to pull down the core snap, the kernel snap, and the gadget snap that you specified, along with any ac extra applications that you requested, and actually put it into a, a flashable image. At that point, you can just flash it to an SD card, put it in the Dragon Board, and boot. So you can see that. You know, hopefully, you can see that, that this is something that once you have this image, you hand it off to the factory and, and you can start rolling right away, right? So it, it's really pretty simple. Once you have your board, right, the, like the Dragon Board, you develop your application snaps and a cool box, and, and, and that's about it. You can ship an image to your factory and, and start rolling on production. So if you're interested in this, there are a couple of ways to, to get involved with the community if you need some help or have some questions. Uh, the first one is that snapcraft.io website that has ge uh, general snapcraft documentation and walkthroughs, tutorials. Uh, Tutorials.ubuntu.com, it has, has some more snapcraft and Ubuntu core tutorials in a code labs format. It's actually pretty cool. It's relatively new. Uh, a good friend of mine put that together. And if the tutorials and documentation don't answer your question, ask one on askubuntu.com. Uh, there are a couple of tags there that, that many of us are subscribed to, uh, the snap and Ubuntu core tags in particular. And finally, we have a couple of different real-time chats that you're always welcome to join. The Snappy Room on Freenode and, uh, and a Rocket Chat instance, uh, rocket.ubuntu.com, the, the Snapcraft channel in there. I'm Kai Rofa, if anyone wants to ping me directly. And that's, that's all I have. So uh, if anyone has any questions, yeah, I, either for me or for my colleagues here, please. The, the core snap you're talking about? Yeah. Yes, that's correct. And what is that's, that's essentially a root of S. It, it's, it's, uh, what? What kind of stuff is it? Like, like awk, right? Or, like really, or libc, some really basic tools that various snaps will need to use so they don't have to bundle them themselves. Okay, so it's like a minimal? Yes, yes, that's exactly what it is, yes. Please. Can you give us an idea of the size? Uh, I don't. I don't know the exact sizes, but I know like the minimum specs. If that's if that would answer your question. Uh, so the numbers. The numbers that we have are 800 megahertz, 512 uh, megs of storage, and a gig of RAM. And you don't actually need a gig, but if you add many applications, you probably will. 512 megs of storage. Mm -hmm. That's where interfaces come in. So, so the diagram I had earlier where they're each walled off, that's with like complete confinement, right? But yeah, if you need to talk to the, the network, right, then you, you open a little, a little hole in that sandbox with the network interface. Um, there's actually an interface called content that allows two snaps to share content with each other. But that's limited, that's limited to that single connection, right? Or, you need a webcam, right? There's, there's a camera interface to allow access to camera devices, that type of thing. So, so that's how SNAPs can communicate and cooperate. Are the SNAPs have some like Docker work together? Uh, actually, there is a Docker Snap, yeah. So, so they can build on top of each other like that. Um, it, as of right now, it doesn't work the other way around, uh, but we're working on it. Please. How do you verify that it's only installed on your devices? 
Well, okay, so there, there are a couple of things here, and, and Larry will, will, will. So there's, there is the, the base store, right, which is accessible to everybody. Uh, when you push up a snap, you have a couple of options. You can keep it private and, and thus install it only on the devices you have there, right? Or you can publish it for, for anyone to use if you want. Uh, but beyond that, there's also the idea of a branded store, which, which is something I'm not super up to speed on. So that would be something. The bottom line is you can, you can have your own repository with just your snaps if you, if you want to go down that path. Or as Kyle mentioned, you can take advantage of the, the universal store, and any, any company can upload snaps and make those private. So a device manufacturer that only has one snap running on the device would probably want to mark that snap private. And it, and then what you can do is write what's called assertions that would then check which snaps can be installed. And because of the signing that takes place in the factory, uh, you would limit it to exactly which snaps you can be installed in the device. Or uh, your device can connect to your own private store, and then you can make any snaps in that store available to your device, which is, a, which is something that's optional. So does, uh, does Canonical make the, the store application, is that available as something that can be audited or is the source? Correct, available? it is open source and there are instances already out there of people that have customized that on their own. They really want to go down that path and maintain an, an app store on their own. Most, I mean it kind of depends, most uh, device manufacturers are just using the universal store and uploading their own private snaps to that store. Some, like a gateway provider that wants to invite third party developers to develop snaps for their device, they would create their own store and then limit which developers they want to participate in their, their store. But it is open source and you can take advantage of, of that and, and build your own app store from that. There's a pretty good YouTube video on that if you just want to search it. Sorry, another question back here? Sure. Um, One more time, I'm sorry. Oh. Okay, so the way, the way this works is, uh, let's say you did follow what I just walked through and you just added applications on top, right? Uh, every snap is updated. So it's not one big image that you get all updates in, right? Every snap is updated on its own. Uh, but then, yeah, the, the gadget snap, core snap, and kernel snap are, are things that we maintain. The, the store, and then the store takes care of the updates. I'm, I'm not. The big difference yeah. between this and resin would be your device would be built from the OS snap and the kernel snap. And the canonical commitment is that we're maintaining those things with security being this update for a five year period following our LTF schedule. So those are getting updated as often as we uh, deploy security updates, usually every three weeks or so. So um, you get all that for free. Then if you were to have your own snap at the store, it would get pushed to the device as often as you update your snap. So the only thing that you would have to maintain is your app snap. And the rest would be maintained by Canonical for everything on the snap. So, there would be no cost for that, unlike with the resin I.O. where they charge you per device. So you're managing the role of, of uh, any updates of the devices in the field. Correct. That OTA infrastructure is available with the Ubuntu core platform. That's part of the store integration with SnapD, et cetera. Yeah. Even if it's less, less of management, it's more your device that has a, a build on it is querying the store to look for kernel updates, OS updates, and then app updates. When it sees that there's an app or an update available, it will pull those updates. So it's a lot different than the Resin IO model where they're they're charged. You say they say, hey, give us your 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 Git, and then we'll manage the deployment at, at a per device cost. There's no cost to take advantage of this this, this platform. Any other questions? Oh.
Oh, yeah. So you mentioned there were different channels for Edge and Peter. Mm -hmm. So each channel, if you push an update to each channel, if you have installed that map, on then it will update from that channel, it yes. From that channel. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's correct. And then a typical, like a typical CI process, right, was just, it would be to publish your dailies to Edge, right, and then you can, as you test them, you can promote them into more stable channels, et cetera. So on the device, is there a way to, if I've installed an Edge or a beta on, on a device and I want to want it to be stable, I want to tell the device to go ahead now download it from stable channels? Yes, yeah, you can. Is there a way to do that? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. From, ew, boy, good question. From like the Snap Web thing that I was talking about? I'm not sure. That's a good question. I, 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 I'm not sure. I would assume so, but I've not tried. I typically do it from the CLI. <laughs> yeah. So when, when you uh, when you push an update to the Universal Store, does it go out to all the devices that are on that update channel right then? So the way the way it works is, if that was the case, right, then you would effectively DDoS the store, right? So so the way it actually works is every device will check for updates four times a day staggered. So it, it's, a, it's randomly spaced. So, so no, it won't be like that. It will be at some point in the next couple of hours. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. But there's no way to say, like, I want to roll out to a small percentage of devices for a few days and see what happens. Not at the moment. I think the way that I would suggest doing that is by using channels. But but I think they're planning on doing something like that store side at some point. Yeah, so like if you could change from stable back to beta, you can actually tell that to a selected number of devices. Mm -hmm. Roll back to beta, and then that might do what you just asked. Yeah, that's exactly how they're doing that. They're doing it with a different channel. And because you, you're given those four channels, uh, usually you have a few, few devices that are set to and it, the channel story is being fleshed out even further with the ability to create your own. So uh, right now we're working on some LTS channels and then uh, so like version specific channels. And then you can actually, what I'm really waiting for is the ability to create one in CI. So like every pull request can have a channel that's just created once so that people can test it. Uh, so we're working on that as well. Any other questions? Well, uh, we're all around for, for at least the rest of the day, uh, maybe a little bit tomorrow as well. So please catch us if you have any more questions. <coughs> yeah, we're, we're in the Qualcomm booth. Oh, we yes, thank you. There on the screen, but if you have any questions, feel free to the Qualcomm booth in the, the showcase center. Thank you very much.